What? Oh my god! Okay, I was looking for fossils, but I guess this is good. Okay, look, I don't know if Starbound actually has the hardest achievements in gaming, but I can say for sure that they are terribly unbalanced. The game, however, has a very special place in my heart. I know what everyone's gonna say, that Terraria has much more content. And I agree, Terraria kept being improved to this day, while Starbound was left forgotten. But I still love its art style and lore, and the game has so much potential. If only Chucklefish didn't drop it completely, I think the game could have seen better days, much like Project Zomboid which is having an insane return in popularity these days. The Indie Stone, the devs behind Project Zomboid, went through a very harsh couple of years in development. Their offices were even robbed during development, and they lost a huge amount of work, months of progress in the game. But they pulled through, and now the game is doing better than ever. So, back to Starbound. When I tried to pursue my lifelong goal of getting all achievements in the game, I realized that some of them are incredibly unbalanced. A lot of the design decisions in the game seem purely random or arbitrary, with seemingly no care for how they would actually play out. I have found my old save from 2017, which had late game gear, so luckily I didn't have to start from nothing. I still had to do all of the mech missions, since those came out after I stopped playing, and also the Bounty Hunter questline just to get access to the true final boss of the game. So here are the ground rules for this challenge. Absolutely no mods. No spawning items using commands. Finding planet coordinates through commands is allowed, however. Trading with other players is allowed. And getting help with defeating bosses is also allowed. After grinding for over 100 hours, I can say that I have gotten all but one achievement. In this video, I'm going to list some of the more difficult or annoying ones, starting with a tireless task. Out of the annoying ones, this is the easiest and most straightforward. At the time of this recording, only 1.3% of the players have it, and I know why. NPC quests are just really boring. I understand that they did what they could with the time and the resources that they had to fit their particular type of game, but once you do 10 or so quests, you start to see the pattern. Go to this very far away location, kill these underpowered NPCs, rescue this person, bring them back. My friend got lost in some other location, go pick them up, bring them back. A bunch of bad guys settled east of the village, just go there and kill them. And it goes and it goes and it goes like that forever, so it gets quite repetitive. I had an apartment building from my old save, so I would just occasionally drop by, do some quests for my tenants, and move on. Since I had late game gear, I would breeze through it, especially since I bore the tunnel to a common quest location, so I could speedrun there, kill whatever my tenants wanted me to kill, and come back. At one point, I thought the achievement was glitch, since I lost count of how many quests I did, and I wasn't unlocking it, but eventually I got it. Yeah, 100%. Other way is like ridiculous. Slow. Oh, I got it. I got the 50 quests. Hey, nice. Oh, god damn it, dude. So, this one is also quite annoying to get. Basically, you have to acquire all racial armor in the game. It is semi targetable since you can craft the armors for the race you are playing as. But for the other races, you have to find merchants of that race to buy armor from them. The only problem is that the armor they sell is random, and the NPC's stock will never change, so you have to look for more NPCs of that race and slowly buy the sets. Or try to spawn them as merchant tenants over and over. But there are 30 armor pieces per race and 7 playable races, so doing this through buying would just take ages. What I did, however, was creating characters of different races to be able to craft the armors. Since the universe is shared between characters, I got all the resources I need for all the armors with my main human character, which was a huge grind by the way. 
made a bit easier by me having a mech with laser drill arms, and then I would find the new character's starting planet and leave the resources there. Even brand new characters can craft late game armor, they just need the resources. I would create a character of a specific race and find the planet they are on using commands, since to find the coordinates with no commands would require me beating the first boss with that character, to fix that character's FTL drive on their ship in order to be able to sit on the cockpit and be able to check the coordinates there, and that would just take way too long. I don't understand why you need to do the first boss mission just to sit on the cockpit. Even with the broke FTL drive, you should be able to still see the coordinates. It doesn't make any sense. I would then go to that planet, leave all the resources needed along with the proper crafting tables, switch characters, craft the armors, switch to my main character and move them to my museum, which was on the same planet as the apartment building mentioned previously. It took a huge amount of time just to mine the resources, and creating the characters and moving the armors was also a huge chore, but after a while I got it. Bing, bing, bing. Oh, okay. This one is not truly targetable. Some codices are guarantee finds and missions, but most of them have to be found on certain locations, like human camps or Florin villages, etc. Meaning you have to find these locations somehow, which according to the wiki can be found on certain planets, but it is not a guarantee, and when you find these locations there is also a chance that they'll only have the codices you already have, so... By this point I got a space station and turned it into my official museum. Moving everything there was an absolute chore, but I also added a codex library there, and I slowly but surely amassed a large amount of codices. I was recovering from the flu at the time, and slowly going insane trying to find the codices. My friend Tony was helping me keep track of the codices and other items needed for the achievements, and I also was marking them on a list I made. Florine. Florine Architecture, do you need that one? It's a... It's not a Florine book, it's a fucking Japanese guy book. Yeah, you don't have it, I'll get it for you. I don't have it? No. Oh, well, you don't have it marked. I don't know if you. Ah, maybe. okay. Yeah, the. It's a Iraqi. fucking Iraqi. Yeah. Every time I say a Japanese word, I feel like that black guy who was doing like <laughs> Japanese karaoke or something. <laughs> like... <laughs> Let me find that. Was it the Naruto opening? I don't fucking know. I just know it was some Japanese song. <laughs> Numerani. <laughs> it says like Nemurani is like Numerani. <laughs> Eventually though, I got it randomly after investigating an Apex lab. Side effects of Veep. I have that. Rain the jar. Oh, I got it! What was it? The achievement. Oh shit, nice. This one was... Ugh. So different biomes can have these different flying bugs you can get with your bug net to complete your collection. Bugs will always spawn on their biomes, so this seems straightforward enough, right? No, not really. The bug spawning mechanics are weird to say the least, and kinda cryptic. Sometimes you will visit a planet and be there for 30 minutes and not see a single bug. Some bugs share biomes with each other, which is ridiculous and it makes this even less targetable, since you'll be at the right biome for the bug you want, and you can still find another bug that you already have. Shit! Fuck, it's not the proper one. God damn it, glow bug. Shh, crap. Oh. Also, I can't truly confirm this, but apparently biomes will only spawn one type of bug per planet. So if you don't get the bug you need on a certain biome, you have to move to another biome or fly to another planet. This one took a massive amount of time. As I narrowed the list, it got harder and harder to find specific bugs that I needed. 
It took me multiple hours and multiple planets to find the last one, but eventually I got it. Oh my god. Yes! Oh my god! Oh. Oh. This one has got to be one of the most annoying achievements in the game. There are 55 unique fossil pieces to be found. When you find fossils on cavern walls and succeed on the little archaeology minigame, you are guaranteed to get a random fossil. Seems okay enough since there's only 55 fossils, but this system has what I call the No Man's Sky problem. You see, when No Man's Sky launched, to get crafting recipes and blueprints, you needed to raid these factories, right? You solve this puzzle where you have to answer a question that is based on the languages you find in the game, and if you answer it correctly, then you get the blueprint. So the first time you solve the puzzle, there's a 100% chance of you getting a blueprint you don't have already. However, after that, the more times you do it, and the more blueprints you have, the bigger the chance is that you will get a blueprint you already have. And then when you need only one blueprint, it's almost impossible to get it, since the odds are so stacked against you that almost all blueprints you find will be blueprints that you already own. I remember being so frustrated trying to get a new blueprint and spending hours finding factories only to get nothing. I can't find footage of it, but I swear that eventually they updated the game, so instead of getting nothing when you got a blueprint you already had, it would just tell you something like, blueprint already known, or something like that. As a dev myself, I understand game dev is difficult, but this just felt like a slap in the face. Like now, instead of giving you nothing, we notify you that we are giving you nothing. So they were aware of the problem, but they didn't fix it back then. But I understand it was a tough time for Hello Games. It's fine. The game is great now, so... They eventually overhauled and fixed the entire system with a tech tree that doesn't rely on chance. But only after I went through the painful process of getting everything the original way, of course. But it was definitely a step in the right direction. So the same system is used for fossils in Starbound. When you get a fossil, it is not removed from the list of possible fossils you can find in the future. There are many smart ways to use game design to make these features more fun and less painful, which I will discuss better and build playable examples in a future game dev video. However, in Starbound, it is just pure, blind RNG. Much like in old No Man's Sky, the first time you uncover a fossil, there is a 100% chance you will get a brand new fossil. However, when you're only missing one fossil, there's a 1 in 55 chance you get the one you need, or 1.81%. It is worse than the bug catching achievement. These types of game systems shouldn't be just made with no planning. Ideally, a designer has to envision what the challenge would encompass. They will try to define a final outcome, like for instance, this achievement should be acquired after a minimum of X tries, but no more than Y tries and then the team can develop the system to fit these constraints, instead of just making the rewards be pure RNG. So I found a post in the Chucklefish forums, it was a guy that had the exact same problem as me. They were missing the, the last fossil for them, which was a human torso fossil, and apparently it took them a long, long time to get it. Uh, they posted a screenshot, I'm assuming they were showing how many fossils they got before they got the last one, and it was probably like a huge amount. Of course, the picture is not available anymore because it is an old game, but I'm not sure I wanted to see the picture because it would probably discourage me in my own journey trying to find the last one. And they just complained to Chucklefish, but of course no one replied. And during my quest to find it, strangely enough, sometimes I would get the same fossil in a row or get multiple of the same fossil in the same cave, which honestly just adds insult to injury. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. And I keep getting this. Oh. 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 I believe I made over 300 golden brushes and used them all just trying to get the last fossil I needed. So after a while I just started to get really frustrated. So I counted the total number of extra fossils I have, they totaled to 570 fossils. Mind you, 
there is a total of 55 unique fossils in the game. Getting 570 repeated fossils when trying to complete a set of 55 is absolutely bonkers. And it just encourages me even more to make a video about balancing these types of issues with rewards because it is something that honestly is not super hard to fix. It's because of the HVAC. It's not. It's nothing to do with the lake. What's that? Heating and uh, wait. What's HVAC? Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Like the vents and stuff. They keep. They keep. They. Fuck. Hey. Sorry. Oh, I think I woke up late first. It's fucking cancelled. Oh, get you get to... you get them when you get the fossil, not when you make the thing. I guess it's it's pretty much yeah, like a list of uh, fossil pieces. Man, mm -hmm. I scream very loud, man. <laughs> the fucking neighbors. <laughs> now this one, if it wasn't for one small detail, I think it would be the grindiest, hardest most boring achievement in all of gaming. For this achievement, you have to collect a total of 10 million blocks. Let me just say that again. Someone at Chucklefish thought it was a good idea to make an achievement for players to mine 10 million blocks. And I understand that sometimes we have no idea of a challenge and how tough it should be, so we just pick an arbitrary number to start off. That is fine, but that is just an arbitrary number that we can balance later. Design is an iterative practice. We designers must refine game elements, game systems, game mechanics over multiple iterations. Things should be playtested and balanced. I am 100% sure this was never playtested and balanced. The first decision that was made was simply the final one and it was shipped with the game with no regards to the user. So 10 million blocks, let's just put that into perspective, shall we? Someone on the Steam forums did the math, so I don't have to do it. Your matter manipulator, which is the digging tool in the game, if fully upgraded, can collect an average of 25 blocks per second. For 10 million blocks, that would be 400,000 seconds, totally 111 hours of just digging. This is absolutely ridiculous and definitely not obtainable if you want to, you know, have a life and not play this game full time for like a month. I can totally see this being decided at Chucklefish. Some programmer probably just noticed that a generated planet has 10 million blocks and he said something like, huh, we should make an achievement for a player to mine all that without really considering the amount of time this would take. And I assume it was just approved with no design passes being done whatsoever. I swear that I tried to do this without using any sort of exploit. I even chose a low level planet with a lot of soft material like dirt, got my fully upgraded mech and started digging. I would watch many hour long YouTube videos on my second monitor while just digging and digging and digging, but then I realized I wasn't even making a dent in the achievement progress. I made an NPC merchant room just so I could sell all my blocks to easily dispose of them. So I caved, no pun intended. I learned that the achievement counts for the blocks you collect, not blocks you mine. So something people do is they fill their entire inventory with stacks of 1000 blocks. They die in lava, they respawn and they collect the blocks. A full inventory holds 40,000 blocks. So each death gets you that amount maybe in 30 seconds. Something that would take me maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get while manually digging with my Mac. So if you do the math, it takes 270 deaths to get 10 million blocks. Still a lot of grinding, but at least it's doable in a lifetime. This is still within the bounds of the rules of this challenge, so I just did that. Still better than spawning the blocks with commands. Got it! Fuck! Huh? I got oh, it. you got it. God fucking damn it. Okay, let's tally up the, the amount of deaths. Mm -hmm. So I got it on my... Uh, let's see, so that's 25, 50, 100, 185, 191, so 191 times 40,000. So I got 7,640,000 blocks from, from, deaths. from deaths. 
-hmm. So seven six four zero. So ten million minus seven six four. Which means that like by playing naturally, I got two million three hundred and sixty hours. Oh, three hundred and sixty blocks. And I have like almost four hundred hours in the game. And it's not also that you just played naturally, you also at some points you went out and like grinded. At some point. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, some points I did the, the thing with the Mac. Mm-hmm. But each trip with the Mac was like, it took two max of energy, and it and it gave me forty k, in like ten or fifteen minutes of game. Yeah. So that's ridiculous, man. And now for the most cruel, underdesigned, and hardest achievement in Starbound. So the game has infinite procedural creatures, but some of them are preset unique to certain biomes in the game. These unique creatures, much like all bosses, have a chance of dropping their own action figure. There's only one issue though, the drop rate of most action figures is not 5%, is not 1%, it is an unbelievable 0.1%. An astounding 1 in a thousand drop rate. Sure, the creatures are easy to kill if you have late game gear, but even finding a thousand of them is a chore. And even if you kill a thousand of them, you're still not guaranteed to get a drop. And Starbound players, don't try to tell me about hunting weapons that increase the drop chance. Even if they do increase the drop chance of action figures instead of just meat and other mob drops, the chance will be so minimal that it simply does not make a difference. They take so long to fire, they're so inaccurate, and the bows take so long to draw that I'd be better off just using my late game weapons for faster kills. Chucklefish could have made and have way better drop rates for action figures, since most throwable hunting weapons are uncraftable and have a low fire rate, and the bows also take some skill to use, but they just added a minimal increase in the drop rate. I can show you this using a simple Monte Carlo simulation I built as a portfolio piece to apply to a certain game company a few months ago. So, you're probably asking yourself what the heck is a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, to explain, I'm gonna show you this uh, example of a shooting chance Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so imagine you have a game where you can have different uh, conditions to the environment and different conditions to the characters, such as rain fog, and the character can have missing eyes, or a weapon that gives them uh, a better headshot chance and the target can be wearing armor and can be moving or not moving, you know, much like RimWorld, pretty much. And then you want to know the chances of landing shots or landing headshots or how much is your character going to miss uh, during a certain circumstance. I'm pretty sure this can be done mathematically, uh, but we can also use a Monte Carlo simulation to help us find out. So let's say I want to test uh, if it's foggy and my guy doesn't have one eye but has great perception and the target has terrible agility. Uh, I want to know uh, what are the chances of landing shots and headshots and so on. Uh, so what I can do is I can simulate uh, hundreds or thousands or millions of shots and then I can uh, graph it to see the average chance of it happening. So let's do a hundred iterations. So you fired a hundred shots of which 39 were hits and from those 21 were headshots. So that's basically the accuracy of this scenario. Uh, so essentially a Monte Carlo simulation is when you have one or multiple inputs that can interfere with each other and you just simulate it uh, thousands of times to try to get a result from that, right? Because if I just shot once and it missed, it's not that it's gonna miss every time, that doesn't represent much, but if I shoot uh, maybe 5,000 times, uh, then uh, the average of that is gonna give me a reference of those conditions and what they mean in the gameplay. Also, this takes too long, so I can just do an instant simulation. And the more iterations we do, the more uh, accurate it becomes. So you see, so this represents these inputs right here, see? So if I do it again, it does not change much, you see? It is doing 5,000 shots, but it is staying pretty much 
within this area here with very little variation. But if I do just uh, 100, then we can see that it, it varies a little more. But it's still pretty accurate. It still shows a somewhat accurate representation. Just wobbles a little bit more, but more iterations is better. So let's give them a sniper rifle, but also uh, let's make the target move. And now the target is wearing a helmet. You see, so some of the headshots, they get blocked. So there's this great video by Leos Labs. He tries to find the area of a circle using a Monte Carlo simulation. So basically he samples points within that box uh, and then he sees if the point lands inside the circle or outside. After hundreds or thousands or millions of iterations, it becomes more accurate. And then he can define uh, the area that is inside the circle just by using the Monte Carlo simulation. I'm gonna link the video on the description. And now for the drop rate uh, Monte Carlo simulation. It is a pretty simple uh, simulation. There's this character here, we can kill him. And then he's gonna drop uh, one of the four items based on the drop rates of those items, which we can change as well. So I can kill him a bunch of times. You see that the gem is the rare thing that drops 1.5% of the time. And here we can see that, you know, out of 49 tries, we dropped 41 swords, which means that our expected accuracy of 95%, which we set here, it is close to our uh, actual accuracy of 83%, with a deviation of 11%, which is kind of a big deviation. But the more we do it, the deviation tends to go down, if you keep looking at it, right? So let's do it like a thousand times. Let me just speed it up. Cool, so after a thousand tries, we can see that uh, our expected accuracy of 95%, it matches the actual accuracy pretty closely. So 94.3%. Uh, with a deviation of 0.7%. So that's pretty good. Um, and the same goes for the other items. So for Starbound, I'm gonna make everything unobtainable except for the gem. Uh, one in a thousand, I believe it's 0.1% in Starbound. So that would be the action figure. And let's kill it a thousand times. So we dropped one, that's, that's pretty good. We dropped two. Yeah, I see, so one in a thousand chance or 0.1%, uh, over a thousand tries we got two, so that's like better than the average. So let's try it again, but with instant results, so we don't have to wait for the poor skeleton to die like a thousand times. See, so we tried it again, we got one out of a thousand. Again, we got three, that's lucky. Try it again, we got zero, so that's unlucky, a little unfortunate, which is a possibility. Uh, I have killed thousands of creatures in Starbound, and I haven't gotten action figures. Now we got one, we got zero, zero, one. So let's try over 50,000 uh, iterations. So now we got 50 uh, gems out of 50,000 tries. That is spot on. So expected accuracy of 0.1% and the actual accuracy of 0.1%. So that's perfect, a deviation of 0%. And as you can see, now we got 57, so a deviation of 0.01%. Um, and as you can see, like the more iterations, the more accurate the system becomes. Yeah, so deviation of, it's always less than uh, 1%, which is pretty good. But let's try a more reasonable uh, number here. So. 140 creatures. I can kill 140 creatures, maybe in an hour or two of playing Starbound. Yeah, we got one. Yeah, but now we got nothing. And we got nothing again. And we got nothing again. And we got nothing again. And we got one. So, uh, the chance is so low that it's kind of hard to predict, right? Because if it's something like 10% or 50%, so let's do, let's do 10% for the sword, right? 
Yeah, out of 140 times, we get 11 times, right? So since the chance is so low, it's really hard to predict, right? Uh, Chucklefish could have done something, like to increase the, the drop rate. Maybe like a late game item that is super expensive, I don't care about grinding, ores and things like that, that increases the chance at least a little bit. Right? In this example, I have the string of luck that gives me 5% drop rate. And now I can drop it 8 times out of 140. But it doesn't have to be 5%. Let's say if they made it like 1%. Killed 140 creatures, didn't get it. Sure, that's fine. 140, I got 1. Now I got 4. Now I got 1. Now I got 4. Now I got 4 again. Now I got 1. Now I got 0. So if the chance was 1%, that, that's okay, like that's doable, right? Um, so I truly believe that they should have balanced it more. Um, but I digress, uh, I'll leave the link for these simulations on the description of the video. You guys can check my ish.io page, uh, so you can take a look. So there are players with hundreds of hours in the game, and they haven't dropped a single action figure. I myself beat the game once, and before I started to pursue the action figures, I had only gotten one by chance. There are also boss action figures, most of them have a 1 in 20 drop chance, which is not too bad until you realize that you have to do the entire boss mission before facing the boss, making them more achievable than the regular mob action figures, but still an insane chore. Especially on the last boss, which is a very long mech mission with a long, unskippable dialogue before the boss battle. The thing is, two of the boss battles have no mission before them, and they have a 1 in 40 drop rate instead to compensate for the lack of a dungeon, so the drop rate is a little more rare because there's no dungeon to do before the fight, so you can clearly see that they tried to balance the system, but I think they could have done a better job. I have killed Ezra Nox countless times before getting the action figure. Simply put, it's just a huge grind. No, Igor! <laughs> no, Igor! <laughs> Don't get a white liquid and put it in there, no! I'm not, I'm not doing anything. No! <laughs> <laughs> That's too much. What the fuck is that, Igor? <laughs> it's coconut water. And out of the regular action figure drops, there's one that stands out as being probably one of the hardest to get in the entire game. They're called Parasprites. You see, Parasprites have a 1 in 100 drop chance, which is not that bad until you find out how to locate them. Parasprites are found in USCM ship encounters, which are one of the many space encounters you can find when entering space anomalies. So space anomalies are not based on coordinates or seeds, so you can't just type their coordinate on your ship to visit them. You have to visit any systems and just wait for them to appear randomly, making this not targetable at all. Upon entering an anomaly, you have to hope for RNGs to generate the USCM ship encounter. The wiki states that there is a 1.7 chance of finding any specific encounter, so your chances are very, very low. So upon finding the USCM ship, you can find three pair of sprites inside. Yes, even after the insanely low chance of finding the ship, you have three shots at getting the drop of an enemy with a 1 in 100 drop chance. They would not respawn and the anomaly would disappear over time and you have to find another one. There are just too many dice rolls in a row. Just so you have an idea, I have dedicated hours to finding the USCM ship and found it only once. I have obviously not dropped the action figure from any of the pair sprites there. Chucklefish clearly did not think this one through. It is truly a shame. And I understand that they were probably burnt out, they didn't want to work on it anymore. But this is something that could be addressed with a simple patch. They could just change the, the rate of how many USCM ships you find. They could increase the number of pair sprites. They could make pair sprites spawn in other locations. There is a plethora of things that could be done to address this. But they just abandoned Starbound altogether. 
After a lot of grinding and many 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 times doing the same dungeons over and over, me and my friend got all the boss trophies. We also got their more easy to drop boss weapons. A wooga. <laughs> a wooga. No, no, put it back, put it back. I'm, I'm on the other window. A wooga. No, like, don't, don't fucking move. It's uh, like bulging eyes. A wooga. We even managed to eventually get two boss figurines per boss so we could each have our own. Whenever my friend would drop a regular mob action figure, he would kindly donate them to my museum as well. Stretch goal race. Yeah, oh, for dude, the Kickstarter. I got the Batong figurine. Dude, Tony's fucking modding the game. Stop mod modding this fucking game. <laughs> fucking no. <laughs> skill issue, man. <laughs> Stop modding this fucking game, man. Three in a day is... <laughs> man, it took me fucking three days to get Ezra Nox fucking every day, like, labor. I mean, I still don't have Ezra Nox, so... I eventually found a post on the internet from a guy called Dude Killer saying that he had multiples of an action figure. So I reached out asking if he could give me his duplicates and I told him I had no duplicates of mine but could farm any resources to give him in return. He was really cool about it saying he could give me the duplicates for free. I also let him hold some of mine, especially the boss ones, since just collecting them counted for the achievement and then he gave them back. So shout out to Dude Killer for helping me with this. After I got all the other achievements, I found myself with a total of 24 action figures. I still have 26 to go, so I'm almost halfway. This was, of course, with the help from my friend Tony and Dude Killer. But I'm afraid this is as far as I'll get by myself. I love Starbound, but frankly, I played a lot of Starbound lately. And honestly, these achievements and these like weird drop rates and these weird design decisions just made me a little tired of the game. So I'll put the game on my Steam Deck, I'll back up my save and I'll put it there. And I'll try to grind some action figures whenever I have some free time on the subway or at the dentist's office or something like that. But I still won the last achievement. At the point of this recording, 1% of the Starbound players uh, have this achievement. Which is kind of weird, because it is maybe harder than the other ones. Um, and I don't think most people that have the achievement got it without using mods or spawning in the action figures. You can easily mod the game to increase the action figure drop rates. And a lot of people do that, and I think there's no shame in that. But I want to be the person that gets the achievement without changing the game whatsoever. Without using mods, or without spawning in the action figures. I want to do it either by dropping them myself or by trading it with other people. Because I keep trying to make sense of the very very low drop rates and the fact that you need 50 of them. And my theory is that Chucklefish envisioned Starbound to be this like massively successful game that everyone played. And then of course a lot of the hardcore players are probably going to drop one or two or three uh, action figures. And then there would probably be a trading scene, kind of like trading cards. People would like exchange action figures and then a lot of the hardcore players could get action figures this way. In that way, it makes sense for the drop chances to be so low. But since the game has died and there's no trading whatsoever and everyone's modding the game and making the achievements easier, it just ruined everything. But this is what I propose to you guys. Maybe we can make this a collective achievement. If we crowdsourced this achievement, maybe everyone that participates can get it. If I have a few people helping me, maybe 20 or 25 people, each person focusing on one action figure, on one unique enemy, they could donate it to my collection in exchange of having access to the collection to hold every action figure that I have. At the end of it all, I can host my save to whoever participates, so you can visit my space station, where you can get a few of the hardest achievements I mentioned in the video. Because that's where I keep all the armor, that's where I keep the llama costume, which I didn't mention on this video, but it's also a little bit annoying to get. I keep the fossils there, and I keep the action figures there. So if you have Starbound in your library, and you want to play the game, or you have played before, or even better, if you have an old save, 
and you either have some action figures laying around and you wouldn't mind donating them to the museum or if you want to grind to get a specific action figure then maybe we could turn this around and make this terribly balanced painful experience into something fun as of this recording i need 26 action figures so if i could get maybe 24 people to each laser focus on a single action figure each my friend tony and i could focus on specific mobs as well we could probably get this in no time I'll make a spreadsheet containing the action figures that I have and I'll keep it updated so people don't try to get action figures already in the collection. I know this is a huge stretch since Starbound is a game from 2014 and most people prefer Terraria and a lot of people hate the game, but I do believe that this can be achieved eventually. So expect a future video about the last achievement. In the meantime, I will for sure make a video about better ways to do random loot drop chances and unlocks. I'm gonna do it in Unity, I'm gonna upload uh, a version of the project so everyone can try to experiment around the drop chances. And until then, I will be grinding for the action figures on my Steam Deck. Hey guys, Iggy here. I was just reviewing the video and doing some less bits of polish before uploading. And I feel bad now because I feel like I was too harsh on Chucklefish and also Hello Games. You know, about the Chucklefish controversy uh, where they allegedly didn't pay for some of the people who worked on the game and they used free labor essentially. This is something that I do not condone and if it is true, it's something that I completely do not agree with. But when it comes to the other things in the video that I complained about, the lack of balancing, the arbitrary design decisions, I don't know how it was behind the scenes, so I can't say for sure, of course. Uh, of course, those are things that ultimately frustrated me a lot as a player, but as a game developer, I should have had more empathy towards, you know, the developers. Because I have been in similar situations where uh, we had to ship a feature that ultimately was kind of bad, and players complained about it, and they would say, something like oh why did they leave it like that couldn't they have fixed it and in this video i was basically the one complaining so i feel bad you know sometimes there are issues that are bigger than us like burnout is a big one sometimes you've been working on a game for years and years and years and development seems perpetual and it seems like it's never gonna end it's like derek Yu, the creator of spelunky said in his book the last 10% is the last 90%, and it really does make sense. Um, I have been in situations where, you know, something as easy as changing a variable to patch something, it seems like such a huge amount of work because you're so burnt out from it. So I do feel bad that I badmouth Chucklefish. However, it's just me wishing that the game was better because I love it a lot. I have a lot of good memories playing it. Uh, when I was a little younger. And with Hello Games, you know, I was really frustrated uh, with No Man's Sky at launch, just like most people. Uh, but I can say for sure that the game these days, it is amazing. It is a great game. I have played a lot after launch. Each update made the game better. And a lot of systems that I used to hate when the game launched, they were completely scrapped and they were properly balanced. And now the game is super fun, so if you haven't played it, you should play it. Yeah, so I just wanted to say this, uh, just a small update uh, if you're a Dwarf Fortress fan. I have just updated my map visualizer for Dwarf Fortress, uh, Dwarven Surveyor, and it now has the ability to search for sites and regions. So if you want, you can get that on itch.io, uh, you know where to find it. I'll put the link in the description as well. Uh, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well and uh, happy new years, everyone.